Hello. Can, can everyone hear me? I can hear myself, which is weird. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so we thought we'd interrupt your afternoon of Formula One racing, Jaguar racing, astronauts, with family history. Right, let's all take a breath, let's <laughs> settle down, let's do some genealogy. Um, but seriously speaking, the problems we face and the issues I'm going to talk about today are far more complex than real-time computing because they revolve around people and why people do hobbies, why they behave the way they do, and how we can use data to get people interested and uh, get the most out of things that they want to discover in their lives. So a little bit about us. Um, we're one of the largest family history services in the world. We've got an insanely large collection of British and Irish records and Commonwealth records and North American records and Australasian records. We've got exclusive partnerships with the National Archives and the British Library. In fact, in collaboration with the British Library, we're the largest collection of British and Irish newspapers online. And the feather in our cap is the 1921 census, which is the most recently publicly available census. And uh, it's only available online at Find My Past. So you should definitely sign up and check that out. Uh, and, and the picture there is the type of thing that we geek out about. So that's J.R. Tolkien's 1921 census return. And you can see he's got ridiculously cool writing. And you can see the translation of that, if you're interested in his books, into how he writes Elvish uh, and so forth. OK, so we're awesome. History's awesome. 1921's awesome. What's the problem? Well, how do we get all of that information, all of that history, all of those stories in the hands of users? How do we grow as a business? How do people make discoveries? We're not a transactional business. We're a subscription. Subscriptions are basically based on the perception of some kind of utility or value down the road, in the future. Right? I'm going to enjoy this for more than just today, for the next 12 months, 3 months, 5 years, 10 years, whatever. Beyond that, hobbies are hard. Right? We're a hobby. So if you compare a subscription to Netflix, you can sign up, just start watching. Just go through everything, be there for several weeks, never see the light of day, and you can be happy. If you sign up to a running app, well, it'll help you, it'll encourage you, but fundamentally, you've still got to go running, and that's hard. Now, family history goes a step beyond that because everything that makes us interesting like the Tolkien census return, is very personal. All of those stories, all of the finding of famous people in your family tree, all of the newspaper clippings, that's almost unique to every single user. Right? We can't create mass segments because people want different things and we'll be able to extract different things from the hobby. So we can't use that traditional method of looking at marketing and looking at how many people convert. We've got to rely on behavioral data. And this is where we've kind of flipped the model. Certainly at Find My Pass, we're not unique. Lots of companies have done this. But it is the key to our growth. And that's moving away from funnels, which should die in the hobby world, to journeys. Or if there's something slightly wrong with you, you can call them multi-dimensional funnels. Here, we can't just consider dumping a load of money or volume in at the top in marketing and waiting for some single conversion event at the end. We've got to consider absolutely every waypoint along a user's life cycle with the product, right? So where they came from, how they're building a family tree, what record sets are they searching? How are they using product features? How are they reacting to CRM? And the way we do that is by combining every single source of data we can for particular users. And the, the icing on the cake is the event-based data. And we use Snowplow. Um, Yali's over there. You can talk to him about how awesome Snowplow is. Um, 
But what we do is combine that with all those other technologies that we've got there. I haven't put in an architecture diagram because that's, that's quite dull. What I'm really going to tell you is the general ethos is how, of how we're using all of that stuff. So imagine a user comes in. Well, they're going to come in through some marketing channel or direct. Um, sorry, something's vibrating in my pocket, which sounds wrong, but it, it, it is. Um, so we're going to grab Google Ads campaign data, say. We're going to sync that through Fivetran. And then we're going to combine it with this raft of behavioral data that we're getting from Snowplow. So we're, again, we've removed the LT or the ETL choice. We're doing several transformations. We're doing them in parallel. And then we're dumping all of that information into a data warehouse. We use Snowflake. We use DPT for the transformations. But that could be anything. And that information is available for marketers, for product managers, for data scientists, for engineers to consume and to make decisions with. But critically, the information that's stored and comes out the right-hand side there is a complete profile of a user, or as complete as we can build it. So that when we understand what products we're trying to build or how people react to things, we're basing it on data. Right? We can understand where people get value, where their interest lies, what parts of family history, records, or newspapers we can provide to people at different times to help them along their journey. And really, there, that's kind of a line that uh, I'd like to say we use quite often, but we didn't. I just invented it for this talk. It's the ability to follow a user from their first landing to their thousandth person on their tree. Right? And if you're thinking, how do people have a thousand people on their family tree? We've got millions of trees that have got thousands and thousands of people. So you've got all that information. How can you actually action it? Right? Data is part of the story, but you've actually got to use it. Right? Collecting it's fun. That's my job. Making it look nice, drawing pretty pictures, that's fine. But how does the business grow? And that's really down to the alignment of the different functions within the business. So again, with the death of the funnel, marketeers now have to look far beyond creating a campaign or um, what the ROAS is or uh, how many transactions they have been. They've got to understand what product we have, how users engage with that product, and really what the feedback loop is. What campaign drives what kind of behavior? What channels create different types of users? And product managers have to go the other way, right? So they can't just build the product that they want. They can't conduct a user survey with five users and go, great, cool, I'm building that. They've got to understand the users that marketing are bringing into the company and build the correct product to facilitate family history for those users. Overall, though, what we're really doing is not shying away from the complexity of the problem. We're embracing it. Family history is hard but it's incredibly rewarding. So that means the data that we use has to be quite complex, and we have to use it in unique and interesting ways. And through that embracing, we're getting closer and closer every day to bespoke personalization journeys, which Irene is going to take you through. Ah, thanks, Anoop. Um, yeah, so I'm going to pick up from where we left and try to give you a bit of an overview of different ways in which we either use personalization or we think that personalization can help us. Because it is all about yeah, embracing how individual an experience it is from, you know, it depends on the surname you have. If you have a very popular surname, you're going to have a bit of a harder time. Um, it depends on the motivations. What are you actually trying to get from the experience? Um, and yeah, and it's all about embracing it and making the most of it. So yeah, I thought I'd uh, you know, divide it into three main bits where we see that personalization can help us. And the first of all is the fact that we actually cater to a really wide range of expertise. So some people come to our site and they've used similar ones before. They know exactly what they want, how to get it, simple. But other people aren't really familiar with the hobby yet, so they need to come in, figure things out, 
And as you can imagine, the needs of those two groups are incredibly different. The second aspect where it can help us is showcasing the value, as Anoop was saying. It's, um, you know, if you don't know how the hobby works at the start, you need to figure out that you're going to build your family tree through exploring those records. It's a little bit hard to understand why you might um, want to do that and get the subscription and get the access to the records. And finally, the last way in which we see us, uh, personalization helping us is bringing history to life. So at the end of the day, all the people in the family trees aren't just records. They're, there's amazing stories there, and we really want to help people understand them. So, um, you know, highlight what would they have been worried about? What would they have been reading in newspapers? What would their schools have been like? So, again, we think that personalization can help. So let's get into it. So the first bit will be yeah, catering to this wide range of expertise. So as we've mentioned, for many reasons, um, some people's progress on our product will be slower than for other people. And that's OK. It's, it's about embracing that. So there, it is worth thinking about the fact that it, it is probably for different reasons. Um, so say someone's looking in an area where there's not as many records available, that might slow their progress down a little bit. Again, it might be the fact that they just don't, uh, they're not yet familiar with the ins and out of, of searches. So one of our main challenges is from all the data that Anoop was discussing that we collect, can we actually gauge the level of expertise of the user based on what they're doing? So are they using advanced search instead of the basic one? Are they using certain fields that give us an idea that actually th this person is quite familiar with what's going on? Um, are they exploring other parts of the product? Because using this, what we can do is make sure that someone who arrives and doesn't know what's going on can get that guidance so that they're not overwhelmed and kind of run away scared. But equally, someone who knows what they're doing, you know, we, do, we don't want to get in their way telling them things that they already know. So yeah, it's about using all that data to, to figure out how to help people. Um, and secondly, what all this data allows us to do, so a bit of a shift in mindset in the way that we actually communicate with our users. So we've gone from a, a kind of model where it was like a certain day after registration, we will communicate with you in a certain way, to well, actually, your first week might look very different to someone else's. So let's communicate in terms of the progress that you've actually achieved that week. Have you started your tree? Have you used search? Um, and that way, we can start pointing you towards part of the product when it makes sense for you. So I guess overall, um, it's about using all this data to make sure that we are communicating with our users in a way that is you know, going to strike a balance between those, those ranges of expertise, and that ultimately is going to be helpful um, to our users. So that's the first, I guess, use case. The second one is what we discussed around showcasing value. So if we go a little bit deeper into this, our product becomes really fun when you start looking at kind of 90s, 20s, 1800s, 1700s, and up. That's where we get loads of records. Uh, that's when we can start doing things in the background like saying, oh, we think this record might belong to someone in your tree. Um, but in order to get there, we need you to build your family tree up to that point. And that's, yeah, not always something obvious, because it's like, well, you're, I'm just telling you things that I already know, and I'm not getting any records or any interesting stuff back. So what we can do is actually give people really specific actions um, as to how we think they're going to gain success. So obviously, if they haven't started their tree, how can we prompt them to start their tree? If they haven't added as many people, we can be really specific and say, hey, can you give us the information on your grandma? Because actually, that's going to unlock a lot of other things. Um, and what we gain with this is once we actually have those records that we can show you and that we can you know, maybe offer a free trial, people start seeing the value more from a personal perspective, right? We're not giving you an example of a tree and how it works. 
it's your records that you're going to be looking, people in your tree. Um, it's the same as with newspapers. You can go down a rabbit hole of seeing how I don't know, the, the Titanic was reported on newspapers, and you can spend all afternoon doing that. But if you actually see the story of someone in your tree, one of your relatives in a newspaper story, that's amazing value. And that really helps, um, you know, I guess people get excited about the opportunities of what we can offer. Um, so, yeah, so overall, it's about using all the activity that we have on our users to, to show them the most meaningful things to them at the time that is going to help them understand how to use the site. And then the last uh, use case is, yeah, what I mentioned around bringing history to life. Um, so we have a vast amount of contextual data. So apart from the record data, these are things like newspapers, like photos. So there's an example here of some Thames floods in 1928. Um, so if you have someone that was living near in your tree, you know, that's something that can really spark a story and questions. Um, similarly, one of my favorites is, this is an Irish dog register. So you can see if your you know, great granddad had like a black collie, and in some of them you even get the name. That can be really emotive. That can really help you understand how, um, you know, just understand more about what was going on with the, with the people in your tree. So again, with all the data that we gather, what we can do here is see, ooh, are there certain people in your tree that you seem to be investigating more, that you're more kind of, you know, you feel more pulled towards? Um, but also, what kind of content are you interacting with in general? Are you looking at a lot of military uh, records, data sets? Are you interacting a lot with the blogs that we do on royalty? Um, and in this way, we can put the two together and really highlight um, stories that we think are really going to resonate with you the most. Um, and hopefully, yeah, get, help you get all that history in your tree um, you know, to life. And I think, yeah, that was kind of what we had today. Hopefully, that's given you a bit of an overview of, um, yeah, some of the things that we're thinking about. And yeah, we'll be around here for any questions that you may have. And thank you very much. <laughs>